sanctify your hearts unto God. And know this, be ready always to give an answer to every person that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you, yet with meekness and fear. And so when people come to you and me with spurious comments, such as one church is as good as the other, or you can have Christ and don't have to have the church, uh, or attend the church of your choice, then we need to be able scripturally, firmly, and always kindly to show why that is false. I want to speak to you this morning on this subject, why the church of Christ must exist. The church of our Lord Jesus Christ has always been in the mind of God. Even before the church was established, it was in the mind of God. Paul writes to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, Ephesians 3, 10 and 11. And so God always knew how it is that he would save lost mankind. It would be through his son Jesus Christ and through the church that Jesus would establish. So why must the church of Christ exist? Seven very clear, simple, easy to understand division points in the message this morning, beginning with this point. The church of Christ must exist because it is scriptural. It has the scriptural right to exist. What do we mean by scriptural? Well, uh, to say something is scriptural means that it has been approved by God through his holy written word. You remember in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work. Now, whenever you study the scriptures, you find that which God has authorized, and God has authorized for the church of Jesus Christ to exist. But we realize that there are many human churches that exist today. These human churches do not exist by the authority of the scriptures because they were founded by men and governed by the creeds of men. Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees as recorded in Matthew 15 and in verse 9 he says of them, in vain they do worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. I do not know of anything that describes the denominational realm any better than what Jesus says on that occasion. They do not follow me. They are following the creeds and the traditions of, of men. But Christ is the builder of his church. Christ built his church. For example, in the passage behind me, Matthew 16, 18, he said, Upon this rock, upon the solid, sure foundation, that I am the Son of God, I will build my church. He's the head of the church, Colossians 1:18. He loves the church so much so that he gave himself for it, Ephesians 5, 25. Now, if the Lord Jesus loves something, then you and I are to love what he loves. And Jesus loves the church. The church is composed of those who are saved. On the day of Pentecost, those that gladly heard the word spoken by Peter and the apostles, they that gladly heard the word were baptized and verse 47 of Acts 2, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So if Jesus built the church, if Jesus is the head of the church, if he loves the church, and if the church com is, com is, is that which, which uh, is where one finds the saved, then it has a scriptural right to exist. It must exist if God's plan for saving man is to be carried out. Here's a second reason the church must exist. The church must also exist because it is good. The church is good. I realize that there will always be those who try to tear down the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Members of the church of Christ who are not faithful definitely hinder the church of our Lord and they, they hinder its influence. But sometimes Christianity unnecessarily receives a bad name. Sometimes undeservedly we hear things said about Christianity, about the church. For example, when I use the term Christianity in its broadest sense, th 
Think about the far-flung places of the world where people under the banner of Christ have gone to, to build hospitals or to provide uh, hunger for others, all in the name of Jesus. You don't really find that in other major world religions. That is what is called com that is what's commonly called Christianity where you find that because any time people go to say a good word about Jesus, that means that likely they're going to want to at least treat their neighbor kindly and do something to help those that are in need. Well, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, the church that is found in the New Testament, obviously wants to follow its Lord. And put this passage down, Acts 10, 38, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, he went about doing good. Is that not a wonderful statement to be made? Would it not be wonderful if every one of us could have written on our epitaph that while we live, we just went about doing good? That's what Jesus did. His followers are found in his church, and therefore they too want to do that which is good. You remember in Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, and especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Brother Andrew Connolly was a giant of a man, giant of a preacher, and some of us in this room were privileged to hear him preach on numerous occasions. This particular pulpit is the same pulpit that stood in the Knight Arnold Auditorium, the only piece of furniture that I know we brought with us to place in this new auditorium when we moved here in 1998. And Andrew Connolly and many other preachers have stood behind this pulpit. And I always enjoyed hearing not only Brother Connolly preach the gospel, but to listen to his story as a missionary going to Tanzania in Africa many years ago. What did he first do? He established a hospital where care could be provided for those who were sick. And once the love of Jesus was shown to those people, what did Brother Connolly do? He preached the pure gospel of Jesus Christ to them, and many were saved. You see, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, wanting to follow its builder, its head, Jesus will engage in that which is good. And I shudder to think where our world would be today if we didn't have the influence of godly Christians who make up the church. Where would we be when it comes to goodness that needs to be found in our world? We are a people who want to engage in good works because our Lord Jesus Christ likewise engaged in good works. Now consider this. There are many institutions found today among men that do some good things. But only in the church of our Lord Jesus will God receive glory. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, Ephesians 3.21. So you see, I want to be found in the church of Christ, the church that belongs to him. I want to be able to engage in good. I'm sure you do as well. And to know that whenever I engage in good work, it is done through the church of our Lord and God receives the glory. That's how it's supposed to be. The church of Christ must exist for another reason. It must exist because it is indestructible. You remember the song we were singing just a few moments ago? Old, old hymn a hymn of Christians going to fight the battle. And the third verse, I believe it is, crowns and thrones may perish, kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. This world has known some great empires down through history, hasn't it? We read about some of them when we study our Bibles. Babylon, uh, Assyria, we read about uh, uh, the Medes and Persians. We read about the Greeks and the, the Romans as we study biblical and secular history. But consider that in more recent years, we have also known some great empires. Half of my life, I knew the country that is known today as Russia, who along with a uh, a number of other nations made up what, is, what was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the Soviet Union. 
And for those of us who've been alive for uh, 25, 30 years or more, we live to see the destruction of that old Soviet Union, its communist system. It came falling to its knees. We saw that. Some of us did. And so it only began as a revolution back in 1917, and then by the late 1980s, it had been crippled. It could be that the great American empire may some t someday fall. Maybe it's already changing in a not-so-good way. I don't want it to fall. Love my country. I know you do too. I want it to stand for, for freedom and stand for what is right, but there's no guarantee it will stand forever. But the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God, is indestructible because in Daniel 2.44, Daniel has revealed the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. And in that particular passage, uh, Daniel speaks of a kingdom that will stand forever. He's referencing a kingdom that will, that will come to pass in the last days or in the days of certain kings. And through our study of secular history, we know what is, what is under consideration there. Roman kings, Roman emperors. That's when the church of our Lord came into existence. And uh, when Jesus uh, was conceived in the womb of Mary, you remember that Gabriel said to Mary, you're going to bring forth the Christ child, the Messiah. You're going to, to bring the one who will save his people from their sins into this world. And of his kingdom there is no end, Luke 1, 33. And so Jesus was standing before Pilate and standing before the governor, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if my kingdom, if it was of this world, then would my soldiers fight, but it's not from hence. Jesus' kingdom is spiritual in nature, and it is that which shall stand forever. Somebody says, well, it's not a large kingdom, is it? Not known for its size, and yet it's going to stand forever. It's indestructible doesn't have anything to do with the size of the kingdom or the church as to its indestructibility. God has always worked through just a few people, hasn't he? I mean, at one time we recall that only eight souls were saved on an ark. Noah and his wife, his sons and their wives, all that were saved when perhaps millions of people were living at that time upon this earth. But they were the saved, were they not? They were God's people at the time, and today you find God's people in one particular place, in the church that Jesus purchased with his blood, his church, the New Testament church. But did you know this, that even if you couldn't find a Christian, a member of the church on the face of the earth, the church of our Lord would still exist in seed form. Because Luke 8, 11 says the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. As long as we have this book and it's indestructible likewise, we'll have that which can produce Christians or members of the church of Christ. Take the seed of the kingdom, sow it anywhere in the world, and you'll produce a Christian and thus a member of the church of Christ. And so the church of Christ must exist because of its indestructibility. Here's number four. The church of Christ must exist because of its principles. In an election season like this, you often hear about what's called values voters. When I think about that term, I'm mindful that everybody has values, don't they? Everybody has values. Those values may not be in harmony with God's values, but everybody has values. Now, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ must endorse God's values. We must be in opposition to those things that God condemns. And so in the church of our Lord, you find both the negative and the positive. The church of our Lord is going to condemn sin. On the other hand, and this is the positive, it's going to extol virtues. I don't know where that's made any clearer than in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians when we read about the works of the flesh in opposition to the fruit of the Spirit. Now listen to verse 19 of Galatians 5. The works of the flesh are manifest which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, 
idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now those are the things we're going to condemn, isn't it? Those things that are, that are called the works of the flesh. And he says, such like, anything that even resembles it, we're going to condemn it. On the other hand, he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. What will the church of our Lord be doing? Promoting the principles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those very things you find in Galatians 5, verses 22 and following, which are identified as the fruit of the Spirit. And so faithful churches do not let the world influence it. Faithful churches rather influence the world, remembering, remembering Jesus' teaching from the Sermon on the Mount that we're to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Here's a fifth reason the church must exist. And that is because of its unity. Now listen just a moment to what I'm about to say. When Jesus prayed shortly before his death, he prayed for unity, didn't he? Unity of believers. Unity of his followers. John 17, 21, that they all may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. Let them be one. Now, having heard the words of Jesus, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and listen to what Paul condemns beginning in verse 10. Something that was not good was happening in the church in Corinth. This was a church of Christ. It was established according to the New Testament order, according to the teachings of the Apostle Paul. But listen to verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 1. Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And why are you writing this, Paul? Verse 11, It hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. I'm hearing that there are, that there are divisions in the church at Corinth, Various sects are now appearing, some saying they are of Peter and others of Apollos, and some say they are of Paul, and some say they are of Christ. Is Christ divided? No, he's not divided. And so uh, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ may be small, but it's united. If indeed churches are faithful to the New Testament pattern, those churches are united are they not it could be that that we go through a period of time when many congregations of the lord's people abandon new testament teaching and thus become unfaithful but the faithful are united following our lord's teaching first peter 3 11, peter says if any man speak let him speak as the oracles of god if you're speaking as the oracles of god and i'm speaking as the oracles of god we're going to be speaking the same thing are we not and thus we're going to have unity. If congregation A is speaking as the oracles of God and congregation B is speaking as the oracles of God, these congregations will be speaking the same thing and thus we'll have unity. Somebody says, well, is that really possible, this kind of unity? Oh, it's possible. It's not probable, but it is possible. As we heed the teachings of Jesus Christ and the writers who were divinely inspired, writers of the New Testament. And so the church of Christ must exist because of its unity. Here's a sixth point. The church of Christ must exist because of its, of its mission. Jesus stated in Luke 19.10 that the Son of Man had come into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. Shouldn't our mission be the same mission as that of the Lord Jesus? who said to his apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. 
And surely those of us today who make up the church of the Lord Jesus Christ want to carry forth that mission. What is evangelism? Evangelism is all about saving souls. It's just an interest one has in people, particularly the souls of people. And so what is our mission here on earth? It is to convert others to Jesus. It is simply saying to a world around us, here's what I found in Christ. I want you to find it too. That I have, that I have found forgiveness and hope and love and joy and peace through Jesus Christ. And if you'll only come to an understanding of the terms of the gospel as laid out in the New Testament, you can have that as well. You see, unlike some religious groups, we're not trying to to convert through coercion. Not trying to force people to the foot of the cross, but we will lovingly teach others to come to the foot of the cross if they will so allow. The Church of Christ must exist because of this noble mission that it has to do good to people. Oh, benevolence, that's part of our work. Not only that, we realize that there are many who have been saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what do we want to do as a church family? Encourage and edify and strengthen one another. That's part of what we do here in this worship assembly. What do we want to do? We want to seek after that erring member who's become unfaithful. We want to study the Bible with that one we might call an alien sinner who's never obeyed the fundamentals of the gospel of Christ. All because we want people to go to heaven. We want souls to be saved. As George Bailey has said in the past, everybody this side of heaven ought to be concerned about everybody this side of hell. Right? That's the mission of the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the seventh and final point this morning. The church of Christ must exist because of its destiny. You see, the church of our Lord, the church of our Lord is that which will safely carry us to a home much better than this. It is because I am a member of the church for which Jesus died that I have confidence and hope in my salvation. Because in Ephesians 5.23, I learned that he is the Savior of the body, and the body is the church. He is the Savior of the body, which is the church. And so he is the Savior of only those who are found in his body, who are found in his church. In 1 Corinthians 15.24, then cometh the end. He, Jesus, will deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. Some speak of the kingdom being established when Jesus returns one day, that it's going to be a physical nation here upon this earth. But 1 Corinthians 15 makes it clear that when Jesus comes again, you already better be a citizen of the kingdom. The kingdom's not going to be established at that time, but rather it's going to be taken to its final destination, its final home, which is in heaven. Oh, you need to be a citizen of the kingdom right now. And Jesus is going to be coming again one day, and he's looking for nothing but Christians. Where will he find them? He will find them in his church, which is his body, which is the kingdom of God. Did you know that the way we get into to the kingdom, the body, is by being baptized into it? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Same baptism that puts one into Christ for the remission of sins is the same baptism that puts one into the body or the church, the kingdom. And so it is that when I extend our Lord's invitation, I never ask somebody to, to come and join anything because I have this understanding based upon what the Scriptures teach. When one is baptized into Christ, he is then baptized into his church. I have to go join anything. Oh, I understand that those of us who gather here at Forest Hill would like for you to be a member of this congregation of the Lord's people. But when one is baptized into Christ, we're not saying that person is being baptized into the Forest Hill Church of Christ. He's simply being baptized into the Church of Christ. Church of Christ, universal. Jesus Church. Now, we seek to be a faithful congregation of the Lord's church. 
and we invite and encourage others in this particular area to come and be with us as we seek to serve the Lord faithfully. But when one is ready to become a Christian, he simply needs to know, I can be saved through Christ and through His church. And that same baptism that puts me into Christ, it puts me into His church. And therefore, I don't have to go and join anything because the Lord has added me to His church. Acts 2, 47. You see, if we're going to enjoy the spiritual blessings that are found in Christ, then we're going to have to be in Him. But to be in Him is to be in the church. So the same spiritual blessings that are found in Christ are likewise found in His church. To be saved by the blood of Jesus means one must be saved in the church because the church is the blood bought. And so the church of the Lord Jesus Christ must exist because it's part of God's divine plan. What does the church have to do with your salvation and mine? Dear friend, understand this and understand it well. It has everything to do with our salvation. And that's why you will hear this preacher from time to time dedicate sermons that speak and uphold the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in it. Thankful I can be a member of it. I want to honor that church through the life that I live because I know by so doing I honor Christ Jesus. Can you, can you separate Christ and his church? Can you separate the head and the body? No. He's the head of his body, which is the church. And it makes sense when we think about it. You see, everything God does, it's, it's logical. We can understand it. One of the largest religious groups that claims to be part of Christianity says there, there are two heads in one body. One head's in heaven and one head's on earth. And then what's commonly called Protestant denominationalism says, oh, there's one head but there's a whole bunch of bodies. <laughs> but the New Testament Scriptures teach there's one head and one body. And this morning as the invitation is extended, understand that as I ask the one who is here who's outside of Christ to come and obey the simple gospel through faith, repentance, confession, and baptism. And to know that that same baptism that puts you into Jesus whereby you find the forgiveness of your sins will likewise place you in the church, which is a place of safety, a place of security, a place where you can find peace of mind, a place where there is hope. If you are subject this morning to heaven's invitation, having never obeyed the gospel, this invitation is for you. Do you have obeyed the fundamentals of the gospel? Do you, do you sometimes forget just how important the church is? Do you sometimes forget just how important you are as a member of the body? Maybe you have. Maybe you need to rededicate yourself to the proper functioning of the body of Christ. If you're not doing your part, then it's not functioning as it ought. And therefore, give special consideration and heed this morning to how you treat that which you say you love, the church which belongs to Christ. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>